Hi right, friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Aside from the unknown regions and a few pockets in the Outer Rim, the Galactic Empire's territory spanned across much of the known galaxy. The records aren't clear about how many inhabited systems there were within the Empire, although some sources claim it's as high as 50 to 69 million systems while others say it's closer to perhaps 12 million systems. Should also keep in mind that a system like Corellia has five inhabited worlds and worlds like Coruscant had a population of over a trillion. But then you would also have worlds like Kessel or Jakku that had very few inhabitants on them. The point is the galaxy is teeming with life and it's spread across a massive distance, which means it's very hard to keep order. This has always been a massive problem for any galactic government, whether it was the Republic or the Empire or something else in between. Now, the Republic's strategy was always to just guard the core and mid-rim world with a small peacekeeping group. This is where the majority of the Republic's economic and industrial production came from. The Outer Rims, on the other hand, lacked a population and also lacked a lot of representation in the Senate, so they were pretty much left alone. Demilitarization a thousand years before the Battle of Yavin meant that most planets were kind of expected to create their own local defense forces or planetary militias. This was easy for a planet like Quat, which was home to a giant orbital shipyard, but very costly for almost everyone else. Now eventually, the Republic would create a free trade zone, which would encourage private organizations to come in, take over, and then build their own infrastructure and security. But this strategy ultimately did not work out great for the Republic, and the galaxy was pulled into a massive civil war between the Core and the Outer Rim. The Empire had a more hands-on approach. They would introduce a planned economy, nationalize many of the strategic resources in the galaxy, along with the military-industrial complex, so that they could create a massive fleet they control everybody. While many contemporary historians will argue that the Emperor did stabilize many regions of the galaxy, especially in the earlier years of the New Order, the Imperial fleet was still ill-equipped to guard all of their territory. This only became more apparent when Emperor Palpatine started relying on the Tarkin Doctrine. Tarkin understood that with the current configuration of the Imperial Navy, it would be prohibitively expensive to control the entire galaxy due to the deployment of a massive fleet. And even if a massive fleet like this could be built, small stateless insurgent forces using slash and run attacks could prove to be difficult to stop. He proposed the concept of Rule of Fear. This idea was to make people so terrified of the consequences of fighting against the Empire that it would prevent any further dissidence. Everything in the Galactic Empire, from the Star Destroyers to the Helmets to the ATATs, were created with this concept in mind. The Doctrine also relied on making an example of someone, or in some cases, entire planets, to get their message across. Of course, we'll see later on in the Star Wars Saga that the Tarkin Doctrine didn't work at all. The destruction of Alderaan was seen as cruel and unnecessary, and once the Rebels were able to destroy the Death Star over Yavin 4, the incident actually caused an upswing in Rebel recruitment and also an upswing in Imperial defecation. Defection. No, defecation. Now, the other part of the Tarkin Doctrine was a reliance on the massive Imperial-class Star Destroyer. It was said at the height of the Galactic Empire, the Navy actually had 25,000 of these ships. It was definitely an impressive battleship. Had the Galactic Republic had access to the ISD, they probably would have made short work of the Separatist Navy. But by the time it was introduced, we no longer were looking at conventional battles like the ones we see during the Clone Wars era with giant battleships exchanging broadsides. Now where we're dealing with a very different, very small and mobile enemy. The Imperial class was also a very resource-intensive ship that relied on a complicated logistic system to continue its operation. We'll see during the end of the Galactic Civil War that the usually reliable Imperial supply lines were basically falling apart. This effectively meant that many of the Imperial class Star Destroyers that were still left were operating at partial efficiency. Aside from its cost and maintenance issues, the Imperial class Star Destroyer also required a massive crew. The ISD, which was roughly around a mile in length, had a crew of 37,000, along with a legion of stormtroopers. As we've mentioned before in other videos, the ISD was essentially a forward operation based with its own private army. But like many things in the Empire, it was overkill and geared towards a more conventional foe rather than the asymmetrical style of combat that would define their earlier years of the Galactic Civil War. Now, aside from the 25,000 Imperial class Star Destroyer, the Empire had a wide variety of different ships, ranging from the massive command ships down to the smaller ships like the Gazante class cruiser. The Gazante class was around the same length as a modern day jetliner with a length of 64 meters. I would actually consider this ship more of a freighter rather than a cruiser. And if you look really closely at the Gazante class, 
It's essentially a civilian hauler with some military upgrades on it. And this is probably because it was built by Carillion Engineering Corporations, and like most CEC ships, the Gazante class was quite flexible, moddable, and so the Imperial variant had additional shielding, armor, weapons, and could carry either four TIE Fighters or Walkers. At the same time, though, this ship was also commonly used by the Black Suns during the Clone Wars period. It was also a popular choice for Zygerian slavers. While individuals like Lando Calrissian were able to completely modify their CEC freighter into a formidable warship, when you're looking to arm a massive galaxy-wide fleet, you probably want things to be working straight out of the box so you don't have to go look for aftermarket parts. As an enforcer of the peace and law, you also want a ship that can dominate its surroundings. While the ISD certainly fit that description, the Gazanti class cruiser did not. It wasn't powerful enough and could easily be overwhelmed by a small rebel cell. This is where we get to the Arkadin class light cruiser. At 325 meters long, the Arkadin was a true light cruiser. Designed and built by Quad Drive Yards, it was mainly used by the Galactic Republic as an escort class ship. It was fast and nimble enough to screen larger ships from gunboats and fighters, but tough enough to take a few turbo lasers from a capital ship. The Arkadin served as a replacement for the Consular class cruiser. At only 115 meters in length, the Consular class was a product of a thousand years of peace in the Republic. It was slow and under-equipped. The Republic did upgrade many of these Constant Class cruisers with the C-70 Charger package. This added more turbo lasers to the ship. Then there was also the CR-90, which was far better designed. But like all ships from CEC, they were mainly designed for civilian purposes. The Arkadins was built from the ground up for warfare, and therefore superior in almost every way to a civilian freighter, from its design choice to its material choice through its weapons placements. Which is exactly what you want when you're making a large order for the Empire, something that is purposely designed to be better than the civilian model. During the transition from Republic to Empire, the Arkadins class light cruiser was upgraded into Arkadin class command cruiser for the new Imperial Navy. This modification mostly included bolt-ons that added more firepower and armor to the ship. The new Imperial light cruiser had four turbo laser batteries, eight quad laser batteries, concussion missile launchers, and a tractor beam. The extra point defense batteries and tractor beam were both quite useful against the new threats the Empire faced, which usually came in the form of small groups of civilian ships. Although the Arkadin was about one-fifth the length of the Imperial-class Star Destroyer, it actually cost about 38 times less to build. It also required less than one-fortieth the amount of crew to operate as well. So if you took the same amount of resources that the Empire spent on building 25,000 Star Destroyers, you could build almost a million light cruisers. And who knows how many light cruisers could have been built instead of the Death Star. What we do know for sure is that 38 light Imperial cruisers can probably control a much wider area than one single Imperial class Star Destroyer. As well equipped as the Star Destroyer was, it could only be in one place at a time. And unlike the Venator class Star Destroyer, the ISD lacked longer range snub fighters that were hyperdrive equipped. The reality was the Imperial class Star Destroyer was never in the right place during the right time. It usually got there way too late and the rebels were already well on their way. In combat situations, the Imperial light cruiser seemed to cause a lot of headaches for the rebellion. A small Imperial fleet made up of three Arkadin cruisers and two Gazanti class freighters were able to prevent the infamous Phoenix Squadron from breaking through an Imperial blockade over Ibar. Phoenix Squadron's convoy was heavily armed and included several Karelian corvettes, along with their usual assortment of snub fighters, along with several inches of reinforced plot armor surrounding the most important characters. The cruiser caused such a large problem for the rebels that they actually had to look for a new snub fighter to help them break this blockade. Eventually, they found a prototype B-Wing with a huge beam laser on it. It was able to defeat the small Imperial fleet, but it was kind of a one-off design. The production B-Wings that we would see the Rebellion use later did not have this weapon. The Arkanen class with its quad laser batteries proved to be especially deadly when it came to hunting down enemy fighters. The light cruiser could also carry a few TIE fighters in its interior hangar to supplement its force. So Imperial Naval Doctrine was really antiquated. I mean like early 1900s antiquated. Uh, they were using battleships and lines and exchanging broadsides with each other. It's just a no-win situation for anyone, which is why eventually here on Earth we went to aircraft carriers and that's exactly what the Galactic Republic did with the Venator. These were not the most powerful Star Destroyers, but they did have a huge complement of long-range fighters. Um, when the Galactic Empire transitioned though, 
you're looking at a more peacekeeping operation. That's what the Imperial Navy was basically doing during this time. And I believe that the light Imperial Cruiser is a much better option. It's just about the right size at 300 meters. It's scary and large enough that uh, most rebel forces won't be able to do too much damage against it. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.